Okay, let's get started. Uh, so let's say this is lecture number two of the Android class. And for this week, I am going to not go through the entire install. This is what your homework was supposed to have been last week, actually. Uh, but some of you are just joining the class today, so there's no, there's no, there's no hurry. But uh, you probably want to get your uh, system installed fairly soon. If you go to the bhacker.com website and you'll click on the links, you can follow the video. And the video, uh, YouTube videos will help you install uh, the Android operating system on a MacBook, on a Windows book, on a Ubuntu book, Ubuntu desktop system. Uh, so long story short, no excuses. Get your Android installed. Uh, because today we're going to go through a couple lectures and then I'm going to go through two examples. And you're going to see, and I, I need to use the examples. And what I'm going to do is... Um, I need to use the examples to actually demonstrate the point because I can't show you Android with showing you PowerPoint all the time. Uh, and this is a tutorial driven course, <coughs> which means that um, what we're looking at in terms of uh, the course and the objective is through various different projects. And then uh, last week I went over the syllabus and I went over all of the different things associated with the course. Uh, so this week what we're going to do is this is a, a real truly our first Android hands-on kind of tutorial and each week will kind of be run like this a little bit of PowerPoint a little bit of talk and then on a little bit uh, about 50 50 and then a little bit of uh, code writing and uh, looking at the source code today we're actually not gonna write probably that much code or we'll do some cut and pasting so you won't have to worry about that um, but anyway just the review and sort of uh, de determine where you're at right now we've already gone through the install or you should be going through the install on your own watching the YouTube site and um, we're looking at the concept of that JDK, so you need to have Java installed. Um, installing the SDK, then on top of Eclipse. So Eclipse is really going to be the interface between uh, Android and the Java system. And, the, and Android, the SDK is just nothing more than an API that's running with Java. It's a Java API. And the Eclipse pl uh, plugins and everything. And then the sample hello world, or hello Android, that you want to do like fairly soon. Um, this particular lecture is called lecture number two. I am not going to go through it with a lot of detail. Uh, in fact, I'm just basically showing you what's in this particular lecture. What I really want to do is hit lecture three today, and because lecture two is all on the install. So you want to get the JDK installed, and you're going to want to uh, set up your environment, make sure your path is set. That's actually kind of important, especially for Eclipse. Um, so there's a video actually on installing Java. You don't need the EE version, just the regular old JDK will work. And um, once you get Java installed, what you're looking at in terms of the SDK is the sort of source tree. And actually what I'm going to do is, uh, actually let's just, oops, just do it this way here. <coughs> I kind of want to show you two screens at once, so I'm going to sort of do this with it. Ah, oh, there we go. That looks pretty good. So I can have the slide out here. And uh, what we're looking at... <laughs> And this is on a MacBook. The tree actually is going to look the same. The hierarchy is going to look the same on a, on a Windows system. But if I go out to my, uh, my home directory, as an example, which is where I have the Android downloaded and installed to, and I open up the Android uh, directory, and it is actually just a directory that you're installing. So when you download the API, um, it's going to be a zip file. You unzip it. You stick it in the path of your Java directory. Um, follow the video, and I'll tell you how to do that. But in terms of the tree, and this is what really what the tree is, is looking at here, we've got uh, tools. And in the tools directory, there's a bunch of tools that I'm going to go through today and orient you essentially. Today's about the SDK orientation and about uh, some of the, a couple of the first two co components of the activity and threads and stuff like that in terms of the Android. But the tools themselves are, they look like they're, in fact, even on your DOS system, they're going to look, and I'll open up the DDA, DDMS, uh, which is a, what, something I'm going to demonstrate today. It looks like a DOS console thing, but a window will pop up. So even when you type in a DOS command or you double-click on an icon, um, a window will eventually show up, eventually here. Uh, this may not show up. At, oh, actually, I think it's going to. Um, it will show up. Here it is here. It's, a, it's not what I'd call a windowing kind of GUI interface. But as a particular example, this is something I, you know, I just kind of want to show you. What, what you could do is not install Eclipse at all and download, unpack, put this directory into your directory structure and use the command line. So the command lines are going to be like docs commands, like open up windows, or maybe there will be icons you can click on. 
And the, what I just opened up was called a debug monitor. And I have a project today I'm going to go through that shows you the debug monitor. monitor. But the other way of doing it is to use the Eclipse interface. And if I open up Eclipse as an example, um, you're going to see why I kind of sort of like e Eclipse a lot better. Because the Android API actually installs itself in the menuing system. And I'm going to see where we're going to see where the DDMS is actually in the menuing system. And so we can access all of the API tools through Eclipse through menu options. So as an example here, and if I go up to the Eclipse uh, window here, oops, hello, there we go. And I, I look at open perspectives as an example, and I go down to others. What I get in here is the DDMS, which is the debug perspective, the debug window. If I do that, lo and behold, I'm going to get the same window. There it is. Uh, but it's in integrated inside of Eclipse instead of a standalone window on its own. And this is uh, just to orient you to this, this particular, it's a debugging window. It's used to see error messages and stuff. And I have a sample project today that's going to show you um, how to write a test, a little test bug and see, see the bug in the debugger. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at this a little bit further down the road. But the point what I was going to try to make right now is that we can change the perspective, let's say, back to Java. And now we're editing Java projects. If you go to the Help menu, if you install it with Eclipse, excuse me, with the window menu, you can see that the tools for the Android SDK manager, the AVD manager, all integrated. In fact, if you go up here and you say new and you say project, you have options now for Android project. So one of the, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely to your advantage to take the Eclipse route is uh, the point I'm trying to make. So you don't have to. A lot of people like NetBeans. A lot of people like the DOS prompt. They, love, they like the terminal window. Uh, but the, uh, the Eclipse interface, I, I want to say, is like the most sophisticated interface I've seen so far for a, a third-party API, if you think about it. Uh, even the uh, emulator will run from the Eclipse browser as well. So just take a, look, a quick look at the orientation, essentially, to the SDK that we're looking at. Um, in terms of the development tools, a variety of tools for developing, debugging the application code, it's got its own debugger, it's got its own... Its own um, test suite associated with it. It's got its own um, maybe three or four different types of interfaces to see different components. You even have an emulator um, an emulator configuration tool where you can add SD cards and stuff like that to the emulator and simulate essentially the real phone environment. Um, also get standard images, things like that, a variety of tutorial samples and stuff like that. Um, the emulator that you're going to see is going to look a little bit newer than this, actually. This is one of the older ones. Uh, so the development tools themselves, I'm not going to spend too much time showing you uh, here. I'd rather show it to you live. But some of the, the main components that we're going to look at today in terms of these examples I'm going to show you, obviously the development tools themselves, the hierarchical viewer. Um, if you go out, actually, back to that directory, whoops, to the, uh, oops, I thought I went back there. Actually, here, I'll do it this way. <coughs> if I go back to the Android directory, change the directory to the tools, if I spell it correctly, there we go. You see um, a lot of the things here, as an example, the, uh, M the hierarchical viewer. So if I ran the hierarchical viewer, um, hierarchy viewer. It's going to bring up a GUI. It's not going to do anything for me because I don't actually have a project loaded in there. If I load it up, let's say for example I, I had a uh, project that I was working on and I had the object hierarchy available and I was able and I used the command line and actually loaded it, I'd actually see it in there. Uh, the other thing um, you know, to, to kind of keep in mind is that these tools are for you to see different parts of the project itself. So an example, the hierarchical viewer is a tool that allows the developers to debug, optimize their code, and the interfaces to the code. It's actually a drag and drop kind of GUI, um, providing visual representation of the layout of the hierarchy, uh, which is kind of means, uh, means a lot in terms of being able to look at the display of the pixel grid and actually kind of focus on it. If you have been in already, looked at the XML interface to the um, 
to the screens that appear on the Android, and uh, they're kind of small. They're kind of extremely small, hard to see, hard to plug and play. So the viewer is essentially an approach to give you a little bit more support in terms of the GUI development and uh, hierarchical views. The debugger, and uh, actually the debug bridge, the ADBs, uh, that's just a tool that enables you to install, actually. So to install the packages themselves, the emulator, to devices, to commands, and that, if we go into the Eclipse browser, what we're going to see is that menu option appear on the top. And the window on the top is going to be the AVD manager or the SDK, which is the actual AD, AD uh, ability to... Um, come in, oops, it's going to do an update for me, uh, come in and update not only the SDKs, in fact, I just recently downloaded, there's a newer one out that less than a week ago, 4.03 or something like that, that I didn't have um, as from the install. Uh, but this is the manager here that is uh, running the uh, ADB. And so if I ran ADB, I could actually run it from, let's say, for example, here, I can go, Oh, it's not there anymore. It is probably... Mm, no, it's not going to be there anymore, actually. They took it out because it's uh, it's called something else now. <coughs> but essentially, the, 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 the situation is being able to load up to install packages um, and to update the packages. Because what's going to end up happening is you'll find an example, you'll find some source code, and it'll be using a uh, depreciated library or something, or it'll be using an emulator that you don't have or, you know, something. So you build the emulator, you import the package, and it allows you to kind of have direct connectivity with the Android repository. And it's just like doing, an, in Debian and Linux, it's just like doing an app get on a repository library, um, if you're familiar with that concept. Um, but it's not command line, it's all GUI based. So that little screen will allow you to definitely update everything. Linking of the standard debugger to applications code, also uh, running an emulator or a device, is going to be done through the ADB. It's no longer actually called, there's no, there used to be a toolkit and used to be a command called ADB. I just noticed that it was missing uh, a few minutes ago when I tried it. This one's still around now, developing tool, the, the Draw9 patch, which is another tool that's available. So what you see, what you get, graphic editor. Um, offers a handy way of uh, creating images, 9-patch images. Nine patch images uh, might be um, stretchable bitmaps, as an example, uh, with the Android itself. Let me see, actually, a little test here. <coughs> At nine draw is in here, so if I go like this and go draw nine patch, <coughs> this will bring up a kind of like a, like a GUI editor. If I let's say, for example, opened up a file, and uh, I believe I have a IT logo file in here. Uh, here it is. Works with PNG files. The PNG file opens it up. It's the IT. It's the old IT logo, actually. Um, and I used that in one of my projects recently, which is why it's here. And um, it allows you to do sort of, you know, um, let's just zoom it out a little bit. There you go. Uh, it allows you to, to do some modifications to it, to adjust it, because what ends up happening is you have this huge, big old image, right? And it gets shrunken down to fit on the screen. And sometimes it doesn't look right. So you can stretch it in different ways, reduce the resolution of it, modify the images of it, so that your icons look nice. And you'll see actually on the emulator today, I've taken our huge logo and I've shrunk it, I shrunk it down into something small and I'll, I'll show it to you um, using this particular tool actually. Um, so that is another one of the tools that's available to you in the um, API. And uh, the problem is a lot of people don't know about any of these tools. So you open it up, you start using it, you know, there's a tool for that. There's a tool. For, there's a tool for practically everything, and there's like a, about a dozen or so of these add-on tools that come with the API, above and beyond the programming aspect of it. So stretchable bitmap images, which uh, Android will automatically resize to accommodate the different uh, contents of the views and stuff. Uh, so you can uh, audit. Excuse me. You can edit and uh, create your own customizable stretches and stuff, or lack of stretches, and minimize the kind of weird effect that might occur. Yeah, actually you'll see on the simulator in a few minutes that logo actually looks pretty good. Looks like a looks like a really nice icon on there. So Android Asset uh, Package Tool AAPT is also another package that uh, comes by default. Tool allows developers to create Android package files, APKs. There's also a tool in Eclipse to build a package automatically for you. If you were to build a package, people go, well, why do you want to build a package? Because you want to put it on a phone. So, uh, unlike the iPhone, actually, you don't need a license, you don't need to go through the market. You can actually take it and put it on the phone 
without having any create a package after it, an APK, which is an application packet. Um, so it contains the binaries and the resources and everything that you need to do to put it on a phone. We also have the DDMS, as I kind of showed you a few minutes ago, the debugger or the monitor service. So you can load the emulator, and here's the other thing, and this is why the emulator support is a little bit better than loading it on a real phone, actually. Because on a real phone, do you have another screen you can pop up to debug it? No. Do you have anything else to, to customize anything about it? No. Um, but everything runs in a thread on the Android, and it's a Unix. It's actually it's built on a Unix environment, so Linux, Unix. So we, when, we have the edit, when we have the emulator up, we can load another um, debugger, this DDMS, that is running in real time along with the process that's running on the emulator and we can see messages and we can actually kind of troubleshoot problems and things real time. In fact, it'll be helpful to do that when we start over looking at the SMS messages and stuff like that, uh, especially or even the, the mapping program. So much information comes through the debugger that we can take a look at and we can see, well, why is that causing that problem? Why isn't it refreshing correctly? You know? And it helps you kind of helps you kind of figure out problems. So to let you developers manage processes um, on an emulator or device assisting in the you know, assist in the debugging of the program. Functions that um, happen, um, and this you'll get a feel for. Um, most students just close the emulator and open it back up again. But why bother? Emulator, if you well, we're going to figure out very soon, it takes forever to load. So if it takes that long to load, <laughs> you're going to leave it up as long as possible. But you can use the debugger to kill a process. A process is going to be a program that's not working correctly, obviously, or something that's not not selected. So killing processes, selecting specific processes to debug, generating trace data, viewing heap and thread information, you know, so tracking screenshots and emulators on devices and stuff. We, um, and as I mentioned before, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's like a dozen of these tools. This is a highlight of the most important ones that you'll probably end up using in this course. Um, the interface descriptive language. This one is integrated in, uh, no longer has a command line interface to it. Uh, let's debuggers generate code for the uh, interprocess interface, uh, such as a service, something a service might use, um, shared data between different processes, stuff like that. So I think of the concept going back to the process concept, and we're going to see that today as well. I have a program that. Uh, we're going to run it simulates the running of processes and the program itself keeps track of how many times its process has been run and has, has been started and stopped and paused and stuff like that. Um, there is a database, SQLite, actually, that's on the phone. And uh, we're going to have, uh, later on in the course, we're going to have a uh, program application that we're going to build that's going to use the database. There's a debugger tool called um, SQLite 3 um, and the tool is used to uh, let you essentially uh, look at data files, create data files that are going to be used with Android applications and simulate the data component and the database connectivity. In fact, it looks like an SQL window. If you load it, it uh, gives you a prompt uh, just like, and let me actually just do a quick check here, SQL, and here it is, SQLite is on here. So if I ran SQL uh, ITE3, I got a prompt here, I can go, you know, select star, I don't know what databases are there, but it's like star from something. <laughs> Something's not there. Uh, no such table something, obviously. <laughs> so it allows you to kind of test out the um, SQL commands that you're going to be using in the program that you're writing. Um, and it's using the database that's in the emulator, essentially. Um, and so you can get to the em emulator database outside of the emulator, which is nice. So then you can clear out all the data. Okay, if your program keeps starting to add stuff to it, you can use this window as an interface to not only to test but to do maintenance to clear out, build the tables, build the structure ahead of time, and then um, you know or create a script or something like that to run to do some maintenance or something. The trace view also a good one. Uh, in fact, the trace view comes up automatically when you load the emulator. You see on the bottom of the screen, you'll see the trace view, and we'll take a look at that a little bit later when I start running some sample programs. It allows you to uh, produce a graphical analysis view, so the trace log of the data that the developer can generate from applications, running of applications. So we also have a MKSD card. And uh, actually, most people wouldn't use the command line interface anymore because it's built into the emulator support. There's a button you can press to create an SD card, a fake one, actually. But you can also use a real one. If you have an SD card slot on your computer, you can actually hook the SD 
slot on your computer up with the emulator and simulate the environment of the of the whatever would be written. You know, like let's say for example you have an application that goes out to the internet and downloads a file. You can put the file on the SD card, your real SD card, or you can make a simulated card loaded on that. Because uh, what we're trying to do is, you know, make it as uh, troubleshooting rich as possible. So, you know, being able to figure out, you know, issues associated with saving files, opening up files, and also I, in the emulator, you can install, um, you can install uh, packages in there to file readers, PDF readers, viewers, all sorts of different. Um, just as applications, just like you would install on a regular phone, actually, you can install from the market under the emulator. Obviously, it's going to take up some memory. It's going to make your emulator run even a little bit slower, but you might need it, especially if your application is working with something else. The emulator allows you to install stuff on it. So this particular tool helps developers create a disk image that can be used for the emulator to simulate the presence of an external storage card, such as an SD card. DX is also a tool uh, that uh, a tool that rewrites a dot class bytecode into an Android bytecode. Why would you want that? Well, what if you had a really nice, let's say it was a MP3 creator algorithm, you know, like, and it was a command line tool that you wrote in Java, and it took MOV files, no, no, it took a WAV files, and it turned them into MP3 files. And you wanted to use that on your Android app. Well, you can actually convert the existing class file to an Android compatible DEX file because Android actually doesn't use the dot class format. It's a slightly different bytecode configuration for a different runtime environment. Um, so to be compatible, you can take existing code, different objects that exist, and then use this command line argument tool to convert them into DX, DEX files, and then include that with your project. And uh, you know, use use an existing functionality on the phone, which comes in handy, especially when you don't own it and it's somebody else's class file and you haven't compiled it and uh, well you have a license hopefully for it or uh, you don't feel like going back and recompiling it and taking the source code and putting it back in and uh, it just allows you to do some conversion obviously it's only as good as the code is and it's only as good as the code can be applicable if the code's doing something that's not appropriate for a phone it's not going to work correctly obviously you would test it on the emulator yeah you would actually take that, run it on the emulator, uh, probably through a terminal if it was a command line. Most of this stuff is done through command line arguments. Most of the conversion, if you're going to convert something this way, it's going to be a tool that takes something and changes it into something else. You know, like a, like a wave to an MP3 using a, a lame library or something, or using something that is going to do the conversion for you. Um, or it might just be a, you know, a PDF to doc or something kind of conversion thing. And it normally runs in the background, so you could come up with a dummy program, I would suspect. Load the, you'd have to load the, the code on there, on the phone already, so it was available in the directory structure. And then write a little app that um, went and called it, ran it. It would be very easy to test, actually, on the emulator. And uh, it wouldn't really necessarily even be part of the project. It would be just extra code that you'd stick on there, an extra program. Utility. Let's call it a utility. Yeah. There's a ton of utilities, actually, on that phone. You can get to a terminal prompt on the phone as well, and you can actually run a bunch of utilities. It's a full Linux. Under the hood, it's, it's, all, it's based on a Linux kernel. So it's, it's quite interesting. It's a it's different uh, breed of Linux, but it's uh, very computer-like. Very like small little computer on a phone. Even the emulator, you can get to a terminal prompt on an emulator, actually. So. In fact, you can install a terminal, but one's there by default. Um, so we have the exerciser, we have the UI application exerciser monkey. We're going to see that later in the course, actually. So a program that runs on the emulator or the device generating pseudo-random streams of user events. You know, monkey was going to test it a million times. You know, it's kind of like the chair at Ikea. You know, they used to have an old commercial at Ikea where they put a chair in a little box and the guy, you remember this one, they sits on the chair a thousand times or whatever. Well, that's what the monkey's doing. He's going to sit on the chair a thousand times until the chair breaks or something like that. You know, simulate user activity. It's a testing tool. Um, a number of different, it uh, works with a number of different system level events, background processes, uh, clicks, a bunch of system stuff. It can be used as a stress test applicator, application test. And um, then we have the activity creator. 
just create some activities. So the script that generates um, and builds files to compile Android applications. So. And um, in terms of uh, what I was mentioning earlier, I'm going to skip through because you're going to do the installation on your own. And this is lecture site set number two. These procedures, the install process is, uh, I want to say, very old in this lecture set. It's based upon like a Android 2 or 3 SDK, so a long time ago. And um, so it's not, these command line arguments may or may not work for you. Uh, but here's the big picture of what I've been talking about so far in terms of the Eclipse integration. So it's the integration of the development toolkit licensed under Eclipse public license. Eclipse actually is an open source kind of toolkit itself. Open source developed by the, by the community itself. So we have solution providers, corporations, individuals, researchers, all sorts of different people that have contributed to the Eclipse community in terms of the, the tool set and the functionality that exists in here. And uh, here's kind of an overlay of the visual picture of the platform in terms of the architecture of Eclipse in general. The Eclipse SDK works with the Java development tool, uh, plugins themselves, and then also with the platform itself, the workbench, the interfaces, Swing, A AWTs, which is not on here as well, um, all sorts of different interfaces that will actually be, be used in terms of the device. Um, so it, it basically performs device uh, and defines open source or open, excuse me, open architecture for plugins and things. So it's what we considered an extendable IDE. So it's not a closed off system. That's the point trying to be making here. So in terms of the plugin support, we're looking at the JDT, which is uh, basically the capability to create, edit Java, essentially. Uh, one of the interesting things, though, however, uh, with Eclipse, and if you already have an older version of Eclipse that's on your computer, you may be able to use it. However, you want to make sure you get the Eclipse version that's made for Java. So we also have Eclipse out there, different breeds of it. If you go through the tutorial to download and install the toolkit, you'll see there's a C++ one, there's Python, there's one. It's usually two, one or the other. It's going to be the C route or it's going to be the Java route. You want to make sure you got your Java route installed. If you try to take a modify a C Eclipse install from the past, you might end up with problems. It's probably better just to download the current version of Eclipse. And any version of Eclipse past, I believe, uh, uh, maybe two or three years will work just fine. Or, excuse me, prior to two or three years ago. You don't have to have the most current. I think I have Helios and it's working. Oh no, India, Indigo. I upgraded to Indigo, the Eclipse version. That works. I know Helios works as well. So, uh, so these these versions in here are going to be old. I heard some some of the older ones. In fact, I want to say 3.0 is the oldest you can get, and still have it work. I'm wondering why do I want to use an old one? You might have an old system that you're doing this on. If you do, you don't want the current version. Like if you have like a Windows. Vista system or something like that, you're not going to want the current version. Although, you're probably going to have problems if you're on a Vista system. So. And uh, I'll let you open up Eclipse so you can see what it looks like on your own. And uh, the rest of this thing is just going to go through uh, the, de the developer tools that get installed inside of Eclipse, essentially. And uh, one of the things you can do, and I uh, didn't really mention it too much in the video, is once you actually install Eclipse and you download the uh, Android SDKs through this window interface through the ADK through the Android SDK manager you can do all your updating so you never actually have to update it anywhere else in fact you can turn on automatic updating I have it actually turned off right now uh, but if you turn it on you'll automatically update with all of the new APIs that uh, get installed and uh, you can actually go back and uh, I've got it all the way back down to 1.5 no, actually, I don't have 1.5, and so I had 3.0 is the lowest one because I can see the status on the right-hand side here. I didn't bother with some of the earlier APIs, but if I find an example as an ex you know on the internet or something that's using a 1.6 API 4, I can click on this and install it, so I would have the support for it. So 99.9% .9 of all the problems you're going to have is not having the right SDK on there, or not having the right support or something. And uh, you're going to want to run, in fact, the, the good thing is that if you run the sample program, and we did this last week, I believe, didn't we? Did we do this last week? Ran Hello World? Anyone, anyone here from last week? <laughs> we ran Hello World, didn't we? Okay, good. We know? Yeah? Yes? Was that a yes? Did we run Hello World? 
We did not run Hello World. Uh, let's do it now. All right. Well, let's do Hello World then. Uh, we just run the emulator. Okay. Well, let me go. We'll, we'll run through Hello World then. Uh, we'll do that. Uh, so we can create a Hello World project on this. This is also done in the uh, the video as well. So you can take a look at uh, Hello Android Java source. Um, in fact, we'll just see this live. Actually, let's do that. Um, but just tell you what I'm going to show you live is uh, the concept of the of the uh, activity and the concept of the class that's being run for the activity. Uh, but I think I'd rather just show it to you live rather than going through the PowerPoint. So let's do that. I thought we had done that already last week. So. Um, actually, I have it uh, from. A, well, I'll just make a brand new one. Okay, so you just installed. Okay, so this is for the benefit. I know it's kind of a repeat of some of my videos, but this is for the benefit of the brand new people, or definitely the ones who don't even have this installed yet. You've just installed Eclipse. You've just installed the Android. You've finished the video. Now you want to make sure it works. So the way to make sure it works is you make a new project. And what I'm going to do is go through the pieces of the project so you can sort of see what uh, orients you to the uh, orientate orient you to the uh, tool set. If I go uh, File, New, Project, make this a little bit bigger so we can all see it. Then this is the same instructions if you're on a Windows machine or a Unix machine or a MacBook. So File, New, Project. And the project type that we're going to create is going to be an Android project. If you select the sample project, then you're going to have to think a little bit more. Because you're going to have to go, do I want a mapping one, do I want a database one, do I want this one or that one? And right now it's going to be a little too confusing, especially if you're brand new to this. So let's just make a generic project. You can also do a JUnit integrated project. Uh, so if you already have a project created, you can go through here and create a JUnit project and do, do the JUnit on the existing project. If you're not familiar with JUnit, don't worry about that at this point. We'll hit it later on in the course. But in terms of the Android project, that's the selection I'm going to create. And I'm going to go next. And here's the interesting part. You have to pick a project name, and I'm going to call this um, ITU Class Project. How's that? If I spell it right. There we go. And uh, when you install it, you basically created a workspace environment, and uh, it's going to be put automatically in the workspace. So if you use the default location, my workspace is off of my home directory in here, if you can see that in the middle of the screen. You can also add working sets. You can add the project to a group of projects. Like if you wanted to do examples, if you wanted to do something for this company or for that company or something. So I'm going to go next. And then I've got everything you could possibly imagine installed on this computer. If you don't, this is the way you tell what you've got installed or not. I can create a 4.03. I can create a 4.0 project. In fact, I'm going to test out 4.03 because I just installed it this morning, actually. So. Let's see if it works. So it'll save me some time too. Um, if you're doing one of the earlier APIs to support something that was earlier, legacy code, you'd want to pick a price, especially if you knew you were going to cut and paste some legacy code in there. You want to use a previous version of the API, you can go backward. If you do that, you're going to have to create a previous version of the. Uh, in fact, let's do that right now, actually. I'm going to create a 3. No, no, it's not too bad. I'll do, I'll do a 4.0, 4.03. And then here's the interesting thing, and uh, most people aren't really, especially if you took my Java course, I didn't really go into packages that much. Uh, so let me explain the concept of the package and what you're doing here. We already have the project name. The package name, think of it sort of like a URL but backwards. And, if, and think of it more like a directory structure. So if I were to create a package for this, I would probably, because, you know, it's for ITU, I'd go in reverse order. I go edu.itu, <laughs> and uh, well, let's call it um, examples. Doesn't matter what you put in here, it's going to be the directory structure for which it's going to be finding all of the pieces of information which in your project. And it's kind of, uh, if I were to do it correctly, I probably would, uh, yeah, that's about right. So you don't want to use more than uh, two or three dots because it gets kind of hard to remember. And uh, you can put one in there. I believe you're going to get an error message if you just put one. Yeah. Package name must have two identifiers. So, ITU. So, I could do that. But if I wanted to do 
examples, and then I wanted another package that did uh, projects, assignments. I can keep all my projects together, all my examples together. What does that allow you to do? Well, share classes between the project. If it's in the project, it's accessible to the project. If, excuse me, if it's within the package, it's accessible to the project. So it gives it global scope for the project. If you use the same project package name for all of your projects, they are in good shape. <laughs> because then everything's all held together. You won't have any problem with loading a new class in. And I'll show you how to load a new class in in a few minutes. But we do want to create an activity. This is going to be an activity-based project, and I'll get into that in a few minutes. And then do we want to do a create a test project? If we have JUnit, we want to use JUnit, we can click on that, actually. If I'm not going to click on it because I'm going to it's going to complicate too much stuff when I show this to you. But for every one of the classes that we create, we can create a JUnit class that goes along with it, which would be the test class. So when we compile and run it, we can run the program, put it in the emulator, and then on a separate note, we can run the JUnit classes, and then we can exercise all of the functionality of the methods and make sure that we're using all of the data and that all of the methods are performing correctly. And it does unit testing for us automatically. And it will create the stubs for each one of the test cases automatically for us. That's if I click on that button right there. Uh, but we'll have a, I'll do that further down the road. I'll have an entire lecture on uh, JUnit. But for the purposes of getting through the creation of our first project, I click on Finish. And then I end up with this ugly looking red thing here. And uh, the ugly looking red thing is a matter of time. So if, you try, if I try to compile this right now, I'm going to get an error message. And it's because I have a lot of stuff running on my computer. I'm recording this lecture. I've got recording software running in the background. Um, I've got so much stuff going on. And if I wait long enough, the red, up oh, there it went, it went away. If I wait long enough, the red thing will go away. What is it doing? It's setting the configuration. It's creating the package. It's putting things into the package. It's doing a lot of, like, background stuff. The background stuff that it's doing sometimes doesn't run fast enough for me. And if it doesn't run fast enough for you, you can go into Project, and you can go into Clean. Especially if you've suspected that some of the background stuff is messed up. <laughs> if you clean, and I'm just going to clean projects selected below here, instead of clean all projects, and go OK. It just kind of goes back through and cleans up. It does garbage collection. You know, it could change the name of something. It, it keeps a lot of temporary memory. It keeps a lot of... Uh, state information, uh, previous attempt, it, it logs practically everything. Uh, and so it'll clear out the logs, it'll clear up everything, and it'll take, usually, if you just created the project and those little X's haven't gone away, if you clean it up, instantly everything will just be right. So let's take a look at this project up here, and this is the one I just created. Um, when we look at the directory structure, it's actually stored like this out in uh, workspaces. So if I go out here, whoops, make this a little smaller. Whoops, oh, hold on one second. Let me get out of SQL Plus. Actually, let me just close this window and start fresh. Out here, I believe my workspace directory is going to be here. And lo and behold, it is right here. Workspace. I'm going to see here it is the ITU class project. If I change the directory to ITU class project, this is a text version of my graphical user interface. This is the graphical user interface version to it. The same, these are the directories that show up in the workspace directory. So in the SRS, the source directory is going to be my one source file. The good thing about uh, Eclipse, however, is it graphically shows you the information that you wouldn't normally see, such as, for example, the package package name. So inside of this package, I've got my first activity. It's an activity uh, because it's the default that was selected for this type of project. The activity, let me just double click on this for a few minutes here, and it should open up the source in the right-hand window, which it does. Just like object-oriented programming in C++ when we created a class, extends inherits extends extends inherits from the activity from the excuse me the object activity called when the activity is first created this is going to be a hello world we don't actually have to write any code for this it's going to put hello world on the 
on the screen for us because it's actually using a string uh, va value that's stored as a resource, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. And the resource is going to be the main text for the window. Um, but when we do a super, the super, if you remember from object-oriented programming in C++, or excuce me, uh, of Java, <laughs> C++, actually, same, th same thing true for C++ as it is for Java. Super means, and I usually say super back, it means go to the class above it in the hierarchy and call the constructor for that class. And, or, you know, you're basically going back to the method or going back to the constructor of the previous class. So super says on the create, which is on create, creates an app, is what this does. Creates the interface for us. And now on that, we're, we're going to super back to the activity, which means we're going to run the on create. We also have an on create here. So this is sort of like the equivalence of the constructor. If you think of it sort of in Android terminology, it's not called a constructor, it's the on create. But it's when the object is actually, the instance of the object is created and the process is started on the Android phone, this particular activity is going to go on. What's going to go on? Well, we're going to actually set the context view to this layout r.layoutMain, and you're going to what is in the world is r.layoutMain. Well, if we go further down the hierarchy here, we click down here, we're just, just taking us to the method level. The onCreate method is in part of the project um, ITU class project activity.java. If we don't like this one, we can come up here and say file new class, and we can put another class in here. I'm going to call this one test class as an example. And I'm going to say finish. And lo and behold, I've added to this structure now inside here I have test class. And if I look at this stub that was created for me automatically for test class, what do I get? Nothing. Because I didn't inherit from activity this particular case. So it doesn't mean I always have to inherit from activity. I can create a new class. I can have an activity and then I can inherit from something else. I can do, you know, and we'll see well, I think today we're just going to work with activities, but we'll see as we go through the course, we can inherit from many different levels of the hierarchy. If I want to delete this because I'm not going to put any functionality in there, I just right mouse click and I select to delete. And uh, it's going to ask me to confirm it. I'm going to say OK, and lo and behold, it's gone. No more. So the source file in this particular case is just like, just like what you've learned in C or C++ or Java. Every functionality, every object goes in its own class file. And it's called a .java file in, uh, in Java. You're never going to touch this area here where it says generated Java files. You're never going to touch this because when you start touching this, you're going to start messing things up. And this is the r.java that's created for you automatically. It's updated for you automatically. This is when I was going back to saying, you know, things happen in the background. Every time you make a change to the... GUI, and I'll show you that in a few minutes, the r.java gets updated on its own automatically. But what if you had like a system failure, the whole thing crashed? Then you use the clean. <laughs> so the clean actually doesn't come in handy, because clean will go back and rebuilds the r.java file for you automatically. So just in case. And what is the r.java file storing for you? Attribute information. So it says auto-generated file, do not modify. I highly recommend not modifying it. Any string information that might be used is going to be in here. We have the application name. We have a string called hello that's going to put hello world on the screen. Uh, and we can modify that if we wanted to. But we're not going to modify it here. We're going to leave that alone. So never touch this generated. And I like the fact that it says generated Java files here. It means don't touch it. <laughs> they should have just put don't touch it there. You're never going to touch this either. This has got the one file for the 4.03. This is the uh, automatic API file the, that I selected. If I open this up, I'm going to see a ton of stuff. A ton of stuff. This is all of the support files for the package, for the import of everything I'm going to use for bundle, for everything, for OS. Everything OS related is going to be in this directory. You don't mess with this one either. And you never mess with assets either, and there's nothing in assets, unless you're going to use it for something. Let me actually, well, Talk about assets a little further down the road. Bin, you're not going to touch bin either. Bin is just going to have compiled resources. So you're not going to touch bin. You will touch the RE, RES, the resource directory. That one you are going to touch. The resource directory has two files, has one file in it in particular that you're going to touch, and that's called the Android manifest. 
The Android manifest has two forms to it, and so does the XML file that you're going to use to create the GUI. There's both a text view and there's a GUI view. This is the GUI. You can see it's a GUI view. <laughs> so it's setting the package, the version number, uses SDK, stuff like that. We also have the uh, Android XML view to it. This one is the, believe it or not, is easier to view. This one's telling us that the application name is that activity. If we put a different class in there, like for example I put that test class in there a few minutes ago and I want to run that one instead of this one, this is saying that the main, the first object that's going to get instantiated is going to be whatever I put here. So I can have multiple different classes running from the same project if I wanted to. Just switch it in the manifest. Manifest is controlling the entire activity. It's setting the API level. It's setting the version number. It's setting all of the information. Here's the SDK level, the version here. Um, the application name, which is actually taken from a string, and the uh, the string itself, and I'll show you the strings in a few minutes. It's going to be another resource that you can modify. Um, so the application name, uh, things like that, are going to be in terms of the application. We're going to see this when we start doing intents and stuff like that, where we're making manual changes to this. Most of it will be done in the XML interface, and the oops, XML interface is uh, basically uh, oops, what happened here? I was trying to use my hotkeys to make this smaller again, but let's go out of that window. There we go. <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh, definitely a little easier, although it doesn't look easier. It looks a little easier. It's just like writing HTML code with tags. There's an opening and a closing tag for each one of the statements, and you're writing text in there. Inside of the resource, if I click on this little arrow to open it up, I have the stuff that I am going to change, and the changes that I'm going to do are either going to be to the layout or they're going to be to string values. And if I open up values, I get string. In the string, I have two strings. I have the application name that's going to appear at the top of my application according to that manifest. And I have another one that says hello. So hello is the name. It's going to say hello, comma, uh, I2 class property. So let's just change this so we can see how, it, how this particular string shows up on the, in the window when we run it. It's going to say, um, Hi there from ITU. There we go. And then uh, the name of the application is set at uh, ITU class project. I'm going to put here ITU demonstration in class. Demonstration in class, which is different than my project name, obviously, but by, by default, my project name put in there. The uh, interesting thing about the GUI interface as well is you can click on the string.xml and you can edit the strings through an XML interface as well. So you've got two views uh, to each one of the things that you're opening up. Only one view to the source code. But to all of the other resources, you actually have a GUI view and you have a graphic view. So some of them, it's the same thing. It's going to do the same effect on the code. In order to save it, you actually have to close the window to save it or use a menu option to save it. I usually just prefer closing the windows and selecting save. And that would close the window for me. The other view is the layout, and this is the main.xml window. And main.xml in our particular manifest said that this was going to be the main GUI that shows to the screen. And the main GUI that shows to the screen, I just double clicked on it, so I'm going to wait here for a few minutes. Yep, there it is. It's going to look like this. It's going to say ITU demonstration in class, and hi there from ITU. And the way I do this kind of thing is I can, I can take and I can drag and drop stuff to the interface. And I'm going to leave this guy on here. It's just going to be, you know, that little spinning wheel thing that happens. And I can take and put a checkbox down here. And it's kind of like Visual Basic or any type of GUI. You're dragging items to the canvas. And uh, when you drag items to the canvas, you can click on the main.xml, which is, the again, the, the text view of it. And then you can see I put a text view, a progress bar, a checkbox. And I can change the properties of these items. So the way that we do this within the code is very similar to other programming languages. Every one of these GUI items has an ID that's associated with it. And the ID is up here. It's the Android ID. And this one in particular is called a progress bar one. So we can say, you know, progress bar one dot layout underscore width is equal to, and we can change the width, and <laughs> we can change the height. And we do it programmatically. 
within our source code. So we have, uh, we have access to this, obviously. So a lot of people would create the GUI first, save it, and then go into the source code uh, somewhere in the class itself and, you know, add stuff to the GUI, make it functional, essentially. Uh, put in the behavior for when the a person clicks on the button. Uh, I didn't put a button here. I put a checkbox, though. And there's text that shows up on the text box. I can, you know, well, my my text box. So I just misspell it like that. And uh, I can I can change property. I can also add to this as well. So think of this more of the definition of the data that's appearing on the screen. So I close the window. I'm going to save it. So I can save it. So now I've added a bunch of garbage to the to, to the window actually, but uh, we'll see that it's that's just going to sit there. So. So the uh, strings, the layout, if we wanted to, for example, put, uh, I don't have an icon in here, do I? Instead I have, here it is, I have the I icon here, the, this particular one that shows up. I can modify these as we've seen before in terms of the other draw um, utility. I can actually import in here if I wanted to. I can go file. Actually, what have we got here? We've got three different resources for, for MIDI. Uh, H, I think it's going to be HDPI. Let's not play around with this. I have another one I've changed the. You can just basically add in, and if I were to do that, I would go um, to uh, File, you know, open a file, add it in, um, add to project. If I were to click on the project, I can right mouse click on it as well and um, basically add resources, add external classes, and stuff like that to the project if I wanted to. So once I'm, uh, I've put, and this, this basic resource here is what shows up on the window on the phone itself. So this is going to be the little icon that you press on, essentially, your program icon. So once I'm satisfied with the code, and uh, just to kind of complete this demonstration here, is I'm going to right mouse, I'm going to, basically I'm going to want to run it, essentially, to see what it looks like. So I can right mouse click and go down to the option to run, and then I can run it as an Android application. Or I can come up here and click on the Run menu, and I can go uh, Run as an Android application. <laughs> and if you've not done this before and you have a brand new install, you're going to get an error message that says there's no associated emulator. So the trick to that is actually to create your emulator first. When you install the SDK in the toolkit, you don't get an emulator. So instead, you go to the Help menu, and, excuse me, the window menu, and <laughs> you go down to the AVD manager and you click on that object. And this is the Android Virtual Device Manager. And the Android Virtual Device Manager, I've created one for 4.0, but I haven't created one for 4.03. This is the first time I've actually created a project for that. Um, I suspect it would probably run it in the 4.0 emulator. Actually, that's a good question. Well, probably because it's the major release, we probably could. Or if I wanted to specifically say I wanted to run it in a 4.03 emulator, I can say new. You can have as many emulators as you want. I'm going to say AVD 4.0. Uh, so let's just say 4.3. 4.3. I don't think the point is going to make it in the name. Eh, maybe it will. Let's see. Target is going to be, oh, it's actually 4.03. So let's see. I believe that's going to be an illegal name, but we'll see. And here's where I was saying before you can set a size for an SD card, and it creates an imaginary SD card in your emulator, so you can actually save files to it. It actually creates a little RAM disk, and the RAM disk actually stays. It doesn't go away. So in between different loads, you can actually keep memory. You can keep files and stuff there, which is not bad, actually. If you wanted to use the files on the phone, it's like having a fake SD card. And I'm going to select Create AVD. Oh, look. It actually allowed me to use the numbering system, which is great. So I'm going to close this window. If I wanted to, however, I can test the AVDs. If I do that, I press the Start menu here. I'm not going to do that right now because it takes too long to load. So, <clears throat> But now when I right mouse click and I go down here and I say Run as Android application. Let me... Log out. I mean, back out of here. Oops. Make this a little smaller so you can see the screen up here. It's going to uh, basically warn me that I have made some changes and I haven't saved them yet, so I'm going to save them. And then it should automatically find, depending upon the API you selected 
for the particular project type that you created. It should find the most associated, and it did 4.03 emulator uh, to load. So if I did a 3.0 and I have a 3.0 emulator, it will load that one. So it looks for the most compatible emulator. I suspect it would probably run the 4.0, even if I didn't create a 4.03. So then we wait a few minutes for the emulator to load. This is the slow part, as I mentioned last time. It's, there's different ways of making this optimized. You can um, essentially cache it so it, it, it basically doesn't, it's almost like doing, a, what do they call it, a hibernate mode instead of a loading and unloading. Unfortunately, for some reason, the hibernate mode sort of causes me problems when I test because the um, package doesn't actually get installed correctly. In the background, actually, while this is running, you can see the console on the bottom of the screen here. And the console is going to show me all of the activity right up from the beginning. So finding the APIs, finding this, finding that, loading on the available emulator, emulator window. Make this a little bit bigger so you can see what I'm talking about. <coughs> it was unable to create a sensor port. Oh, that's fine. Emulator was found, waiting for home now. To be launched. In the background it's still loading and eventually you want it to make sure it says installed or installing. If it doesn't say that it, it probably failed. Um, and believe it or not it does actually fail. And so you're testing it and you're thinking you're testing all your latest and greatest changes and in reality you're not. You're testing the last one you ran because it didn't install it. And I personally have done that myself several times where I go I don't know and then you discover, oh, it's because it didn't install. <laughs> uh, so this is still waiting, waiting for the home. So we'll give it a few minutes. And uh, it will eventually load. In the meantime, I'll get the next lecture ready to go here. Just minimize that real quick. So lecture two is uh, was just a, pretty much a summary of the install. Some of the stuff that was in the PowerPoint, however, was a little bit on the older side. So I will definitely uh, leave it to the uh, YouTube video to give you the install instructions. But if yeah, there's a few little things in there that's uh, a bit more uh, a bit more detailed, uh, so it's not bad reading if you're brand new to this. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the emulator is still loading. So while this is still loading, I'm not going to wait for that. I'm going to start in with the next lecture, which is the PowerPoint lecture number three. It's going to go through some fundamentals and uh, things talking about the activities, threads, processes, stuff like that in terms of the Android market and the Android mobile computing environment, a little bit on the operating system itself. And then I have two Android examples that I'd like to show you um, and uh, that are going to demonstrate different features that are presented in the PowerPoint. So it's just kind of the roadmap for the next for the rest of this part of today's session. And I will, we'll eventually go back and we'll see the emulator once it's loaded completely. So and long story short, you gotta multitask a little bit. So so Android as an operating system, just give you a little bit of heads up on it. It's part of the build of a better phone process, obviously Open Handset Alliance uh, produces Android. So it's it was originally from the Open Handset Alliance. We always hear about Google in there a lot, which is part of the, the concept, essentially. They've got versions of it that work on the Google phone. There's also Android itself is used on a lot of embedded systems these days, and it's not really the phone architecture, rather that it's proprietary architecture that's built on an Android kernel. And it kind of is an extension off of uh, Linux, actually, or the Linux kernel environment, where you build a micro kernel and you stick it on some hardware, and you can customize it for the drivers for the for what's on it. And then you can use the Android as a as pretty much the operating system, which is lightweight. So it comprises uh, handsets, manufacturers, software firms, mobile operators, manufacturers, funding companies. If you wanted more information on it, you can click on this link and it still works. And this is information on the Open Handset Alliance that is actually the main producer, although Google is also a part of it, the Open uh, Handset Alliance um, program. 
In terms of the growth, this is a bit outdated, I would say, uh, but it uh, probably can just double these feet, double these numbers. The slide set comes from Google, and it's about uh, maybe two years, maybe a year and a half to two years old at this point. So, just basically, you don't even have to look at the numbers. Just go that the number of traffic has increased, the number of phones have increased, the number of usage has increased, and as they, things have increased, the features have also increased, and the platform has increased. So it makes mobile phone easier, well, sort of, in terms of the abstraction. So here's the Android applications that are written in Java, and this is pretty much our Hello World program that we just looked at a few minutes ago in terms of the Java source code. We have things, as an example, this at override that will be included in. That's actually sort of optional. Instead, you'd get warning messages. Um, so there are a few things that are built into the Eclipse, um, such as the help system, the warnings, we can suppress the warnings, we can, we can override methods, we can do all sorts of different things um, logic-wise uh, that go above and beyond sort of the basic Java, if you were to think about it. Uh, but we're still using a package concept, you know, which we've seen so far, the I EDU, ITU. We're also still using imports, but we're importing now from activity, from OS bundle, from a bunch of different things uh, that are providing functionality. And this is our basic hello world, uh, basically that same application that we just built a few minutes ago. So I'm some, sort of kind of curious, so I want to go back and see if the application is loaded. Almost. We're almost there. It's a little black though. Here we go. We might actually, we might actually see this work. You see on the bottom it says installing. If you can see that on the bottom of the screen. It says installing ITU class project APK. Which is basically what you would be doing. It oh, failed to install. Launch canceled. Ow! You waited all that time. It's probably a memory-related issue, and the launch was canceled. Well, let's see. No, I think we're challenged. That does sometimes happen. So what I'm going to do is, while I continue my PowerPoint, I'm going to start it again, because it actually might load the second time. So we'll see. Not like the iPhone app, though. Not that iPhone app development was lickety split. This takes forever. Ever. But you know what, though? I've never tested the 4.03, and I usually find if I go back a little bit, I get better reliable results. Uh, actually, with that said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to the window here. I'm going to go to AVD Manager. I'm going to remove this guy here. And I'm going to use a emulator I know works just fine. And I'm going to go, yes, revert back changes. And I'm going to run it in the, uh, because it's the only emulator there. Nope, it's not going to say it. It's not a compatible emulator. All right, so that's what's going to happen then. Uh, so here's the test here. If you don't have it, in fact, I might be hosed here. I might have to change the project back to 4.0 <laughs> in order for this to run. And now I know. Uh, but let me try it one more time because I maybe I wasn't being patient. If I don't have a compatible emulator loaded, I'm going to get this error message here. Let me just simulate this one more time. If I hit on the Android application, I'm going to get no compatible targets were found. You wish to create a new AVD? Yes. And then now I'm going to have to create the AVD. So if I create an AVD here, I'm just going to have to go here and just reduplicate what I just did. Uh, I'm going to call this one 43. Don't be surprised if it doesn't work, if the emulator fails and you have to go back to 4.0. And uh, so I guess it's, it's a good idea that I did this only because now I know not to use 4.03 on here. So I've got the compatible, and then let me just minimize this here. Part of the issue may also be associated with resources on the computer as well. If you've got a bunch of stuff running and you try to run the emulator, it sometimes it does that. It'll fail on you. Moving right along. So the Android applications are compiled to Dalvik bytecode, which is a special form of the bytecode itself, as we've seen in the previous slide. So you write the app in Java, same app that you would write, or same Java code that you would write any other thing with. You compile it with Java, it gets transformed. And that's where we went back and remember, so you have a dot class file and we can convert it basically because we can just take the compiled form and convert it, which is essentially what the Eclipse environment is doing. 
It knows about the API, it's going to convert it, and then it gets loaded into the virtual machine and runs on that Linux operating system. So essentially what we're doing is we're creating the bytecode for a different VM. So instead of for the VM that would run on the runtime environment, the JRE, in the Windows or the Mac operating environment, we have a special one that's stripped down that's small. That this particular version of the VM that is made for uh, micro devices or uh, to Linux operating systems. So it's optimized for mobile applications, which means we can run VMs efficiently. So we create the VM, and this is this is where the concept of mobile application and Android use on embedded systems comes into play, because we can create the kernel, put it on proprietary hardware. Let's see, you you create your own phone or you create your own tablet or something like that, which people have done. Okay? There's a million of these oddball tablets on the market and they're all running Android. Because you compile the kernel for the platform, include the drivers for all of the different pieces, you know, for the USB ports, for the sound, for the audio, depending upon what you've got from a hardware perspective. You load the VM on there for Android and you write VM compatible source code. So it's just the same way as if I wrote a Java program out here and I ran it on my MacBook, or I ran it on my Windows machine, or I ran it on my Ubuntu machine. I run it on my fake iPhone that I've created, or my, my tablet or something that I bought from China or something that is running. Yeah, th th there's a million of them on the market. They're all running Android, actually, because that's what they've done. They've taken that, you know, this made-up hardware that they put together that resembles a fake look. Actually, there's a lot of, I there's a lot of iPads thin little iPad looking clones that are running Android actually. Uh, so I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, it's open source. It's like building a regular old kernel. You build a kernel for it, well, and then you run the VM on top of it. It's running on a Linux kernel, and you run the VM on it, and then you load your software on it. <laughs> and you can actually load on some pretty stuff. In fact, it's pretty app compatible because it's not running on the it's not running on the operating system. It's actually running in the virtual machine. So as long as you make it compatible, and you can, and this is the other reason, that, the reason why I kind of mentioned before, you can take .class files from any, so you don't need a full-fledged API to run it. If you have, let's say you have like a Word program that was written and then you compiled it in Java code, you can convert it using that command line argument that was on the other slide, make it compatible with the particular VM that we're looking at here that's going to run on this tablet or this fake, you know, or it doesn't really, I shouldn't say fake, not all tablets are fake devices of other things, but there seems to be a lot of them that are sold on eBay, and there's a lot of them that are, come from China, they're like imitation this, imitation that, there's even imitation iPhones out there that are running Android, <laughs> so the concept being it's easy, easier than reinventing the wheel, because you're not reinventing the wheel, you're loading Android on it, essentially, if you load Android on it, that's where you get that economies of scale. There's tons of development for it already. You use what you have. You load the kernel on there. You load the VM. Each app has its own VM kind of interface to it. Minimal memory footprints. Very efficient in terms of the optimization. And to revisit this concept, this is what we saw in the day, week number one last week. We've already seen this beautiful, colorful slide. But just to re-emphasize the point, revisit the concept, we've got the Linux kernel on the bottom, the camera drivers, the flash memory drivers. This is what you're building for your fake iPad that you're creating with an Android instead of an iOS, excuse me, instead of an iPhone. Uh, yeah, it's not an Apple. It's a, it's a fake one. Um, and then you're loading your libraries on top of it. Then you're loading your application framework or your VM your virtual machines that are going to be running for your applications that you're installing. It's actually kind of nice, a nice little architecture. So it has many different components. It's modularized out, so you mix and match, and you work with what you have available. So there's a working emulator. This is just an example of an old one. I'll kind of skip through it because it looks kind of old. Uh, so all the applications written in Java are available to each other. Android design is to enable reuse for components in other applications. In fact, we've got a lot of pre-built components for sending a message, creating a notification, for all sorts of different kind of built-in functionality that supports uh, you know, Google phones, actually. So each application can publish compatibilities with other applications, and other ones can use it, So, which other apps can use. So here's a couple of the different concepts in terms of the common structure. This is where, where everything kind of comes together. 
So uh, the Android applications have common structures to them, the views, the content providers, and these are actually today we'll be looking at view and activity manager if I get to that. Uh, I will definitely get to that, those examples coming up soon. Uh, but the views itself has got the grids, the text box, the scroll box, the graphics, the, everything that's going to be in terms of uh, inside of a web browser, buttons, things of that nature. In fact, the web browser itself enabled web browsers will be part of a view, web view. The content providers are going to enable applications to access data from other applications and from other resources, uh, such as contacts, contact lists, address books and stuff. The activity manager manages the life cycle. And this is the one we're going to see. You're going to see an example of the activity manager, and we're going to also see a debugger example as well in a few minutes. A notification manager, and then the resource managers. So the resource managers are going to access to non-code resources, such as look -wise strings, graphics, and layouts, and stuff like that, that nature. So I'm going to stop this slide. So my TA has to remember that I'm going to, I'm going to start on this one next time. I don't remember what slide number that one. Oh, actually, it was number 11, by the way. So slide number 11. So I don't want to bore you with PowerPoint the entire time. But let's see how the emulator is doing. OK, great. Back at the ranch, the emulator is, the process system is not responding. OK, well, that doesn't mean, doesn't necessarily mean that we're hosed completely. Let's take a look at the status here of uh, launch cancel. OK, so my 4.03 is not going to work on here, bottom line. Luckily, however, I've created example number one and example number two in a non 4.03. This is a 4.0 emulator. So I've got my 4.0 emulator out there that I know still works. So I'm going to close this guy out here. Actually, let me just see. Sometimes it actually comes back to life. Actually, this is another good test, actually, because I can have this running in the background while I'm testing the next one. But the beginning of the first time you load the emulator, it gives you a bunch of this stuff. You know, you have to, like, OK to this, OK to that. Uh, this is how you do this. And then the second time, after you get done with all of the configuration stuff, then it works. So I'm going to kind of be patient. I'm going to kind of go through these prompts. And then I'm going to load this emulator one more time while I'm explaining the next example. Uh, then I can see that the app did not get installed. But see, this th this thing comes up. This stuff interferes with the ability to run that app, to test that new app. So I'm going to go ahead and get through all this. There we go. So it can actually can configure itself. The other way you can do it is you could probably um, run it in the AV AD AVD manager and uh, configure it and then run it with your app before you test it with your app. Which is the point. So I'm going to try and just kind of make sure this thing is all configured now. It looks like it's still configuring something else. It is. Look at this. Great. There we go. All right, we are uh, we're all configured here. Now, so I'm going to close this down. I'm not going to set up email. And now while this next example is running, I'm going to, while this example is going to be running again, third time's a charm, I'm going to get into the next example. So the next example I'm going to put out on the bhacker.com. It's not out there yet, but I've written them up in uh, text files. And the text files are going to have you actually create the example. This first one is going to be on an activity life cycle. And the activity life cycle example Make this a little bit bigger. Uh, just go this way with it. Actually, you know what? There's a better way of doing it. I can load this up in Text Wrangler. Yeah, much better. And then I can make this bigger through the View menu. Actually, that's not what I wanted. Oops. Nope. Nope. 
Should open it. All right. Well, I'll just do it this way. There we go. <laughs> so I was gonna, trying to make the text a little bigger for you so you can read this. Anyway, I will put these on. Each week I'm going to come up with, and I'm just now building them, so I need to actually put them together. So I only have two of them for today. And uh, what I'm going to do is kind of create these examples to show the different features. The first one I'm going to show you is the activity that we've sort of seen already, but we haven't seen it this way. This one's actually going to show us the thread and the active life cycle of the program. So the activity life cycle is when the app actually gets started and runs. So in terms of the activity, it's a single focus thing that the user can do. And by definition, usually each screen has its own activity. Applications have their own multiple screens, hence multiple activities. And an application itself runs in its own Linux process. So what we're going to do in this example is look at the different activity states that exist. And the activity states are going to be active, paused, stopped, and killed. And I'm going to keep a variable to keep track of how many of these different activity states have existed or have occurred throughout the life of this program that we're going to run. And so in the active one, the running activity is in the foreground of the screen. So it's every time we click and we run, we pressed on the application, we ran the application, it's going to increment a variable to tell us how many times it's been active. For, for a pause, which is, means we clicked on something else, and automatically, in talking about the concept of Linux processes, and these are processes that are running on an Android phone, as an example. So this kind of overlaps with operating systems concepts. We can actually control the state of the process through the app by detecting the state of the app. So when the app has gone paused, it means another app is being used. So in here, in this program, we're just going to make a counter, and we're going to say it paused once, it paused twice, which means we opened up another app, we did something else without closing this app. In that particular case, if we were building a true app and we detected that it was pausing, we could minimize its resources, whatever it was using. We could turn, you know, we can turn the sound off. We could uh, make it so that the phone actually runs a little faster for the other apps. It's like what would happen when you'd normally minimize something. You know, you want, and I don't want to eat it up resources. So make that app essentially play friendly with all the rest of the apps on the phone. Um, so the pause behavior can be detected, and we'll see that. When the pause happens, we're going to increment a pause counter to say it paused. So when it lost focus, <coughs> but is still visible, still out there, re uh, retains all the state information. It's uh, in extreme memory situations. It may be killed in the background by other processes. Then we also have the stopped. And we can do that just by stopping the app, just by going home. And um, it's not visible. It retains all the state information. And it's often uh, will be killed as well, especially when it's stopped. It should be killed. And then we have the killed. Well, a kill happens every time you stop the application. So when you kill it, hopefully. So to see this in action, we're going to run this following example. Step one is going to be to create a project. Um, actually, I've done this for us already, so we don't have to sit here and go through the process, the strenuous process, but just the same way as I created that Hello World app a few minutes ago, you create a brand new app. And when you create the app, you're going to call it uh, Example Activity. You're going to do that because you're going to cut and paste inside of the ExampleActivity.java class file that gets created automatically, like we saw before. Um, you're just going to take and cut and paste all this code into it. And that's how you're going to create the app, actually. And you save it and it runs. So going back to the app here, uh, let's see, back at the ranch, let's see how my emulator is going. Make this a little smaller. I think this is actually working this time. Wouldn't that be nice if it actually worked? <laughs> let's take a look at the status. Yeah, it is. Installed I2 class project. So third time's a charm, as I mentioned before. So. And this is like the most trying, patient-oriented thing. And I don't have any patience. Oh, no. System, process system is not responding. Okay, you know what? It's still loaded anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I remember I put all this junk on here in my GUI. I put this my text box and I put this thing on here. So you can see our app is working. So when I press home, our app is going to go back. Back there we go, and I can get back at the app that should be installed by clicking on the uh, application button here, and. Uh, as you can see, our app is 
ITU demonstration. I called it ITU demonstration. So if I click on the ITU demonstration, it should load back up again. So now I actually have a working 4.03, but it took me three times to get that to work. So don't get frustrated if it takes you three times. Um, so perhaps the solution to that problem is to actually load it first and see it work first. So. I've taken the liberty to load this assignment, uh, excuse me, example number one, and I will put this again on the website just to let you know. I'll put it on bhacker.com so you can load it yourself. In example number one, let me make this bigger. The thing that we want to look at is the source code. It's the only thing that you changed. You took and you created a generic project, and then you took and you cut and pasted in here. Let me shut this one. And here is the, uh, the source that you cut and pasted and you put it in. Remove everything that's in the window before you do that, actually. And I'm going to create all the examples to run the same way. So you'll create a generic application, and then you'll do a bunch of other stuff. And some of them will have you add additional classes to it, and some of them will have it. And I'm going to try to do is put it in a text format so you can just load it up on any platform. So now we're going to have our process that's going to be paused, that's going to be killed, and it's going to be stopped. I created this as a 4.0 application. Uh, so I know this is probably going to work just fine when I run it. Every one of our uh, data members I put up front, and I put the text view text as a data member, which is kind of interesting because when we start creating variables, we don't really think about GUI items as being variables, but it is actually. It's of a text view format because we have text that's going to be shown up on the XML screen. On the create, uh, and we actually have text view automatically created for us. It's usually what says hello world, actually on the application, so we don't have to do anything of that nature anyway. We have an onCreate, and we're going to run the super onCreate. After a few more apps, you're going to notice this is usually the same. So we're going to always run the activity constructor as well as the onCreate, which is really the Android constructor, essentially. And uh, we're going to save the instance state, get integer pause, get integer killed, get integer stop. And these are going to come out of the different on resume, on start, on end methods. So within your application development environment here where you're creating your app, you're going to put these guys in for different purposes in the future. As an example, on a stop, and these are events, and this is kind of also to demonstrate to the event-driven nature that's built into the app. It has nothing to do with the program functionality. The program doesn't do anything at all. It just prints something to the screen. Um, however, the program can be paused, it could be resumed, it could be started, and it could be stopped. So on those, we're taking and we're going to increment, as an example, on a, on a stop, it's just stopped. Stop's going to be ad added up. This is the simplest uh, example you can probably come up with to test these different methods. On the resume, the re pause is going to be, because it was paused, it's going to be incremented, and then the, re the, re uh, the killed is going to be incremented eventually if it does get killed. On start and on pause, the pause and the paused, if it started on a super start, it's going to be incremented. So we're just basically adding, you know, plus, 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 plus to all of these from the different events that occur in the applet lifecycle. And what it's doing is it's demonstrating to the applet lifecycle as it occurs. So if I run this application, it's actually going to run faster because I have it on a 4.0. Uh, so if I go down here, run as Android application. We're going to let this run in the background while I start in with the next example. <laughs> so, I'm strategically planning the examples with the delay. Uh, so I don't have that other example open yet, but let me just make sure I've got this launch happening here. I can see on the bottom of the window it's 27 percent launching. So I can see it's going to hopefully launch for me. The next example is going to show you the debugger, and it's going to show you, I'll just open it up here. And I will label these example one, example two, and I'll put them in the weekly lecture area. I think probably the best, probably, or maybe I'll just put it in an examples area. I'll put it in a separate area so you can find them. Uh, because as you're building your applications for your, the homework assignments for the course, it's probably not a bad idea to kind of see them work. So in this next example, while the first one is loading in the emulator, we'll go to the next one. This one is going to be a logging example. Uh, yes, 
We're going to look at the log, and we're going to look at the log and the debugger, and we're going to create a special thing to test for something that we're looking for. The great way of troubleshooting is kind of like putting a, something to the screen, but we don't have anything to the screen to put, essentially, well, we could, but uh, it's a way of logging events and looking at the debugger. Uh, and it basically demonstrates also how to open up the debugger um, while the program's running. So create a new project like we did before. Uh, like the Hello World project, and paste the following code, for example, number two, into the Hello World project. When we get done pasting it, we're going to follow these instructions down here. I've already pasted it in, so we don't have to go through all that stuff. But to run the program, we're going to run it in the browser, excuse me, we're going to run it in Eclipse in the emulator. While the emulator, after the emulator has opened up, we're going to open up the DDMS perspective in Eclipse, and then we're going to create a filter for this message here, because we're creating a logged item that's going to be called test, and uh, the data that we're putting in there is me. So we'll see how we can actually look for that and filter, so we can find that. And if we wanted to, we could, you know, make that a usable value for something. Like maybe it's the value of x, and we want to see what x is. We can look in the debugger at while a program is being executed simultaneously. We can kind of see what. You know, what that value is, as an example. So let me see how my emulator is doing so far. The emulator's not doing so well. <laughs> emulator, emulator, emulator. Emulator's not doing so good. I'm going to close the Eclipse real quick and I'll open it back up again. It could be that I have uh, too much stuff running on this computer, perhaps. <laughs> if that's the case, I can, you know, I can also open it up in a Windows window and uh, run it from a emulator, or run it from a different virtual machine, essentially on here. So I can run, but the emulator runs even slower, but it's not as buggy, actually. So. All right, so Eclipse is not appearing to being behaved, so I'm going to force quit it. Okay, yes, I know. Don't report it, just ignore it. We know the emulator can run because we just saw it a few minutes ago. I'm going to skip the first one and go to the second one so we can see that one, actually. And then I'll come back to the first one. So we'll see the process dates. The second one is a little bit more interesting, so. So let's just run. All right, this one's uh, acting a little bit better. It's loading the data for Android 4.0. Good. Oh, there we go. This one's definitely better. So again, you just notice another problem, you know, when you run the emulator too many times. <sighs> Close Eclipse, bring it back up. <laughs> it beats, it's free. It beats, uh, it beats having to set up another machine or buy an Android phone. So. This is actually running quite nicely. So, Very happy with this performance so far. So I'll be patient, give this a few minutes, and uh, keep an eye here on my status on the bottom of the window. You know, the warning, unable to create sensors. Yeah, that was the same problem I had last time. Connection refused. I probably have a security, something security-oriented set on my ports or something, is what I'm thinking. So, In fact, I know the GPS doesn't work automatically. You have to tweak it to get it to work. But you can actually get um, Google Maps to work on the emulator with your current location. But it uses an internet, not a GPS uh, signal. It'll go through the internet to the Wi-Fi network. <clears throat> so as this goes on, I can actually show you the code, which I haven't shown you yet, uh, for this. Actually, I think I just did show you, I think I did show you the code, actually. Let's get rid of that one. That one was showing us our different process states, our different life cycle. Um, actually, there's no code for this, really. It's just the onCreate uh, method, and the onCreate method is going to create a log uh, item with test and me on it. So we'll give this a few minutes 
And uh, if we revisit the instructions, because I'm impatient, we can probably load the debugger simultaneously. We'll see what happens, actually, if we load the debugger. So as the program, uh, as the emulator is supposed to be started and running and working, uh, you open up the DDMS perspective in Eclipse. And so I actually showed you that earlier today in the window. We change the perspective, and this is the interesting part. This is the perspective of Java. We can change the perspective to the uh, debug mode, or we can go other here. And if we go other, we can change it to some of the specific modes that we're looking at. And we want this one here, which is going to be the debug for the Android monitoring. It's a debug and monitoring screen. That's uh, what it stands for. I select open. I can see the screen but the app isn't loaded yet. So let's see what happens as we proceed through here. What, what's going to end up happening is we're going to get a bunch of messages that show up in here. And these are messages that are happening in real time as we're monitoring the activity of the app through the emulator. The debugging window is going to show us error messages. It's going to show us values, uh, things that have happened. And I believe I can open this up before the app is actually loaded, before the emulator is actually there. Yep, look at that, it's actually loaded, which is good. Let me just check to make sure that this is... Uh, I'm going to change the view back real quick just to see. I'm going to put it back on Java, actually. Okay. Make sure I ran the right one. Hmm. Interesting view. Okay, let me go back to the debugger. It should be loaded by now. Except for I got a little... <sighs> a little issue with the debugger today. I mean, excuse me, with the uh, emulator today. I appear to be crashed. Nope, 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 here we go. Now let's just let, give it a few minutes after I clicked on it for a few few times here. Launcher is having issues. I really don't actually have that much running on this computer. The only thing that I could possibly think that might be uh, interfering with it would be the I show you recording software. But that doesn't really take up that much memory. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's the ITU class from earlier, the icon I was playing with. Uh, but I want to see this one here, so. Let me close this here. It's low. Mm, the window should refresh on its own. If I can get the app to load, the debug information will show up into that window in the background. Uh, it's just getting the app to load, which seems to be the problem. Just click on home here. All right. It is actually already installed in this debugger because I tried it earlier. So, I mean, it's already installed in this emulator. It may not actually load. We'll see. I'm optimistic. The good news is I have an iPhone class right after this. <laughs> And although iPhone is not cheap, it definitely runs a lot better. <laughs> the emulator, everything runs so much better. <laughs> not to start complaining about this, but it is going to get a little frustrating. <laughs> well, I'll give it a few more minutes. I don't know how much more time. Oh, here we go, here we go. We've got some activity going on. Oh, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Here we go. Uh, here's example number two. I'm going to run example number two, and I hope it works. There we go, example number two. Uh, the activity itself is not producing the results it's supposed to be producing. Uh, hold on one second. Let me just make sure. No, I did run it, but it may not have been actually. No, it should be. Uh... <coughs> hold on one second. does not appear to be communicating with the debugger window. Uh, so 
it's going to either be a memory issue or an emulator issue, but my window is not populating correctly. In any other situation, this window would show a log of all of the activities that are occurring in the emulator. But I have a strange feeling that the emulator is not functioning properly. Uh, but as another example, and if you drive, if you t test this example at home, what you're going to do is open up that DVMS window, and you're going to see, and you'll be able to filter. If you run through the uh, instructions on the example, you'll be able to put, in fact, what I've done here is I've created a filter. And the filter, when you run it, if we actually had data that was populated from the emulator, it would be able to show us um, the value of tests, which would come out with me, essentially, uh, which is what I set in that code. And what I did is it only set some debug information. So, and the debug information appears in the debugger while the app is running, normally. So, uh, the other option is uh, I've loaded the wrong app, but I don't believe I have. Yeah, app should work. Oh, this is the first one actually. So I can actually demo the first one too. On the first execution, if you remember the one on the threads, um, on the first time I ran that one. I have pause zero, stop zero, killed zero, meaning that uh, nothing has happened. It was the first time I ran the application. Let me kill this window, actually. There we go. And uh, if I go back to home, I've essentially killed it. Or if, actually, I've stopped it is what I've done. If I go back up again and I run it again, I should see those numbers increase. Yep, I've stopped it once, paused it once. If I can't run anything else because I can't minimize the thing, well, actually, I can. I can go this way. Return, run it again. Oops, no, because that's a new instance of it that was run. So it should be, the pause should be increased. So if I go back home and run it again, and I have two instances of this running right now. Because I pressed the return to go back to the menu, I left the first application running, the first version of it, the first thread. And what it's supposed to be doing is demonstrating the thread activity to you. I still have a one stopped, one killed. Excuse me, none, nothing killed yet because I haven't killed it. Um, this should increase, however, with every time that I uh, I start a new instance of it. Now I have two, two paused, two killed. So this is basically just testing the stop, the start and the stop of the application. It should be up to three at this point. Yep, it is up to three. If I could kill this thing or if I could pause it successfully in the emulator, the pause would be if I opened up something else, if this was not as taking up the full screen, and if I clicked on something else, it would pause automatically. Um, I don't have this designed, however, <laughs> to do that. <laughs> but if I could click on something, actually I could use the, uh, uh, the menu, actually, the pop-up menu would possibly pause it. Except for the pop-up menu, it's not going to show on this because there's no menu item created for it. Uh, but essentially, it's keeping track of the number of threads that have been created from the application from the counter. And it's basically, and here we got to four. So it's the life cycle of the app that once you've loaded up the phone and once the phone has started and the app, it can actually keep track of how many times the app has started, stopped, paused, and if you can simulate all those different modes. If I were to kill this somehow, if it were to die, it's not, it hasn't been killed. I've been stopping and starting it naturally. If I had another program that killed it, or if I were able to leave this up and running and go to another screen, I could pause it, but I could also kill it from another screen as well. Um, and if that were to happen, I'd have the kill incremented. But it hasn't killed yet. It would only kill if my maybe my emulator failed at some point. So, if I uh, if you if you go and look at the instructions for step number three, it's going to basically have you create the test. I'm going to test one more time and I'm going to give up on the DDMS, but uh, if I go back into Eclipse, I should be able for every application that's running and in, in this particular case, I should see the debug information in that window. It gives you, it's just supposed to, and any other normal time it has actually done that for me on this computer. Um, and there's nothing there. <laughs> so it actually says it's loading, Wait a minute, loading data See, on the bottom of the screen, maybe I just didn't wait long enough. So on the bottom, it says loading data. It says 100%, though, so I don't know. It is supposed to populate in this field down here with all of the information that's uh, from the log 
of the activities of the, and it's basically looking at the threads at this point, the thread activity. So the starting of a thread, the stopping of a thread, the pausing. Every time I open and close those 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 applications, the debugger is supposed to pick that up and it shows up in the window. So, and the second actually, if you run it at home, the second one, go in here and press plus. Actually, here I'll edit this one so you can sort of see what it looks like. Um, create a filter, call it test. And by the log tag, the tag we created in example number two was test, and the message was me that was showed up. So if you do that, what would show up in the window would be test, uh, test as in, in terms of the ID and the tag. The tag would be called test, and the text would be called me that's associated with it. So you could sort of see it, and if you did that in a real application, you could put little identifiers in there to go, made it this far, made it that far, made it this far. And it's just like a way of putting breakpoints and check, you know, to in status information to see how long, how far did your app get before it actually failed when it actually runs. Because the emulator or starting and stopping isn't really going to give you, um, isn't really going to give you any information. It's just going to show up on the screen. It's just going to say like, you know, failed or something like that. It's not going to actually show you any status information. So, anyway. I think next time I will have some more examples for you. I have to figure out a way of fixing this issue. Uh, the other thing I forgot to show you actually probably earlier when I was showing in the view the uh, tool for the icons is the way that you can actually import images for icons and uh, this is actually the IT logo that is really big but I shrunk it down using that tool and I put it on the desktop to actually kind of show you as an example of how you can uh, I think actually looks pretty good I think actually so how you can actually kind of modify it. But all right, so next time uh, I'm going to work on this emulator issue because I need to be able to demonstrate without all these stopping and starting and stuff. It's just ridiculous. So I will have a solution for that if I have to get another computer or something. I don't know how that's going to work. But, uh, but that's all for today. Next time we will go over, and hopefully I'll be able to get through more examples, and I will be going over other features associated. So today was the concept of the threads, concept of the activity, and the concept of the debugger was supposed to be for today. So if I get it working, I'll take a screenshot maybe of it. Or you can see it on your computer if you try it. Okay, thanks for showing. I'll see you next time.